All right, and off we go. Everybody here? Not really, but whoever. So, second round on dynamic equations. The last time, just recap, we did Lagrange. Lagrange was an energy-based system. L, the Lagrangian, equals kinetic energy minus potential energy. And then we had that little rule which said D, D, T of D, L with respect to theta dot minus D, L with respect to theta needs to be, this has to be capital I, tau I. This is how we got the equations of motion of every degree of freedom. Okay, we did this last time, exercised it, had a huge amount of fun, it was just great. It's a very simple principle. All you had to do is compute kinetic energies, compute potential energies. We spent some time how to do that, how to derive it so that we know what's going on. In the end, kinetic energy boils down to a linear or transitory energy and to a rotational energy. Potential energy is always involved gravity, pretty straightforward. And the main component which we needed was our knowledge of kinematics so that we could go to the individual points on the robot, figure out where they are, where the center of mass is and things like that, and also what is the velocity of a particular thing, which we get from Jacobian. And we do know how to handle Jacobian. And there's an enthusiastic answer of all of you, which is yes. Why is it not looking like that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I assume you know the Jacobian. So we'll, we'll bother you most likely now on the Jacobian, just to make sure that you know it. Good. Um, this differentiation is lovely, but it creates an enormous amount of terms if you have a complex robot. It basically fills pages and pages. Literally, I, I ran this long time ago for a seven degree of ro robot arm like my arm. Um, through Mathematica, which is this symbolic manipulation system, where you put everything symbolically in there, and then you do differentiation, and then you have afterwards, like, literally three, four hundred pages of code and math. It's totally inefficient. For that reason, people were thinking really hard how to make it more efficient. And there is something very simple which kind of indicates there might be something which is more efficient. Most robots, particularly those which we look at, they are open chains. They may be branching at some point in their fingers, hairs. So there's a simple way of going through that. It's already what we've been doing with homogeneous transformation matrices for uh, modeling direct kinematics. One degree, next one, next one, branching out, branching out, branching out. So there's a, there's a sequence. When there's a sequence, there's usually a potential for recursion. That's essentially what Newton Euler is about. It basically tries to go in a different way. It looks at what is called force and momentum balances at every link, and then tries to relate unknown quantities to the previous link or to the next link. And that creates a recursion which makes everything much, much simpler. So in the end, it turns out that Newton Euler equations for my seven degree of freedom arm just become like, whatever, five, six pages. Of, of C code rather than the three, four hundred. And that makes a huge difference. So Newton Euler, the real good versions of it, they are solidly linear. It, it basically, the, the computation which you have to do is linear in the degrees of freedom. So that still is, from a computer science point of view, quite nice. So because this is used a lot, and because there's a lot of useful physics in that, I'll just try to run you through this one time. It's painful for me a little bit too, since there's a lot of notation which goes into that. In the end, you will not be quizzed on that in terms of like derived Newton Euler from me in a quiz. It's not going to happen. Um, but it's good to know about it. Since you know, and, and I had this very fun experience once in this course. After the fourth lecture, someone said in the background, "It's all about physics." This course, yeah, it's all about physics. Robotics is about creating forces and torques to manipulate bodies to do something we want them to do. And that is by definition physics. 
And without physical intuition, you will never understand a robot properly. You need to simply see that there's forces and torques and how they act and what they do. And you need to get your high school physics out and maybe a little bit of whatever college degree physics and, and, and feel the force. Luke, there is forces. And there are dark forces and good forces. <laughs> okay, the good forces push you where you want to go. The dark ones make you fall over. So it's, it's all there, you know, Star Wars, they all anticipated it. <laughs> Good. So let's go through that. As painful as it may be. And I may goof, okay? This is something which I always have to get going myself. But here's what we start with, and that's actually not so bad. Newton, once upon a time, it was about 500 years ago, there was a guy who was watching apples. Not really, this is, seems to be total BS, but um, anyway, stuff falls. And basically the idea is a force comes from a mass which is accelerated. Mass times acceleration. Mass times gravity is our gravity force, okay? One of the fundamental laws which holds quite nicely here on Earth, if you want to go up and do things at the speed of light, things change, but that happens to very few of us. So Newton's equation. And then there is an equivalent to Newton, which is Euler's equation, which just basically makes the same statement about torques. So whenever you basically have a rotating body and you try to change its, 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 its way of rotating, you need a torque to do that. So you know what is the most beautiful example of life about um, these kind of Euler equations is bicycling, okay? Bicycling, the, the basically the balancing torques because your wheels are big and they rotate, and guess what? They don't want to fall over at all. It's just a stupid driver on top who wants to fall over. And all you need to learn when you bike is just learn how to deal with the physical system, which by itself wants to balance. And if you don't believe me, here's the experiment for the night. You go on a hill, you take your bicycle, give it a push downhill and see how far it gets. And you'll figure out it goes quite far before it falls over. Just tells you your bike is actually capable of biking without you. <laughs> Which is very cool. And that's essentially what this equation kind of encapsulates. It says you, you can only make this thing go away from its direction of rotation by applying forces. And by default, it actually wants to not get these forces applied. I mean, if you want to fall over, you have to apply a force. It's not happening by itself. Okay, so then the idea of Newton Euler is essentially a force of torque balance at every link and a recursion through all links. Before we get to the beauty of physics, we have to do something really annoying. We have to first figure out something which is angular velocities and angular acceleration at every link and linear velocities at every link. So we look at, the, at those equations. What I'm gonna do in the end is I give you some, some whatever link body again, which I don't know how to draw very nicely, but something like this. Okay, and I want to basically argue about all the forces and torques which are here. But in order to compute them and to relate them to the mass and inertia of that link, I will these, need these quantities. I need p double dot, I need omega dot, and omega. Now omega, we know how to get. We're good at this. This comes from the Jacobian, remember? We did this the last time for kinetic energy. P double dot, we haven't really cared about yet. And omega dot is just the angular acceleration, or it would be, if we wanted to write it in joint angles, it would be the double dot, the acceleration. We'll, we'll, we'll talk, yeah. We'll see how it relates to that. Um, that we don't know how to do yet. So we have to do a tiny little detour and talk about this first before we do this nonsense. Not nonsense. Really, absolutely. Okay. The book has two chapters on that. I'll just hop back to the book for the moment, but try to explain that as much as I can. And it all starts with this. I have Windows still too big, sorry. Working on it. Here we go. Now it should be fine. This is actually at the end of the chapter of forward kinematics comes a quite cute little chapter about the derivative of a rotation matrix. So why do I care about this? 
because remember that we express a point. If I have a my favorite potato body, which is out here, and there is a particular point of interest on this potato body, which I call now P express in coordinate system one. And then here is the main coordinate system. And I want to express this point here um, with the offset vector, which we can call all from 1 to 0. This here usually was the little vector r in 1. And then this here is the vector p expressed in coordinate system 0. So we have essentially that p in 0 is usually something like O, the offset vector, plus the good old friends of rotation matrix from 0 to 1, times P1. Okay? Makes sense. Now, I want to get to linear accelerations and annular accelerations. It means I have to put somewhere dots. And ideally, I would just put two dots here, two dots there, two dots there, and life would be good. It's totally wrong. So that's not going to fly. Because the rotation matrix is also a quantity which changes with time. So what's the derivative of a rotation matrix is the question of the day. And that's essentially what this chapter addresses. And it's actually very cute. It's it's a little annoying and maybe it's not worthwhile deriving, but actually it has a useful insight. And so that's why I want to go through it. So we start with something which is very simple. Any rotation matrix times its transpose is identity. Okay? Do you agree with that? Everybody who does not agree, just get out of here. Okay? Lots of people are not here, maybe they don't. So next thing is we take the time derivative of that. So that's actually not too hard. So we do r dot times this chain rule. So plus m r times r dot transpose and the time derivative of the identity <coughs> matrix. Yeah, it didn't change. It's a lovely time derivative. It's just zero. So hopefully I created this thing here. And now he basically makes a substitution. So he substitutes r dot times r and calls it s. Okay? And then this here is essentially s transpose. And given that s plus s transpose equals 0, s must be a skew-symmetric matrix. We learned that in the linear algebra started. Okay, fine. So this just tells a little bit what this thing looks like. Now, what does he do next? So basically, he puts this equation here. What does he do? Da, 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 da. Post money both sides, both sides of 3.5. OK, so we go now to the S equation. It's kind of a weird little derivation. So we take this equation. S equals R dot times R transpose. It is 3, 5. Post multiplying both sides of 3, 5 with r of t. So basically, you multiply it with r and also with r here. Okay? You get this. And then he basically says, this basically says, this here becomes identity. So r dot equals s times r. Interesting. So that tells us something about how to express R dot in terms of R. But there's a cheat in there because S is something where we also put an R dot inside. So we gotta get rid of that cheat. So <clears throat> Now, what do we do next? Um, but, 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 he wants to basically show that S has a meaning which we can interpret in a different way. 
And what we're going to do is we take a simple point which has no offset. We have a point where it just has a coordinate system, which is our world coordinate system. And we have a local coordinate system which is rotated, but otherwise the origin coincides. So this here would now be x prime, y prime, or z prime, which x, y, z prime. Okay, so this is essentially what we started. <coughs> And we do say, okay, from that consideration, we can say that a point P in this thing is going to be R times P prime. Okay, is that correct? So, good. And then he does this as the time derivative. So what's the P considered as? And the frame point is a constant vector. So the vector doesn't change. So there's somewhere here um, vector P prime, which does not change. It's fixed in this coordinate system, in the prime coordinate system. Right. Now it takes the time derivative of that, and we just get that. Because P prime is constant, we don't have to take the time derivative. Sense? Right. So, um, in the view of receiving can be written P prime. Now we have R dot, which we can replace with, I can get rid of this for the moment here. We can replace this here with S times R. So we have P dot equals S times R times P prime. Okay? Makes also sense. And now comes the story is that we can also basically look at um, P dot from a general <coughs> viewpoint, which we did the last time. So what about that? We have a body, and we are somehow here on this body, and we have a angular velocity of this body. So it Let's see what else do we need. And we have a vector. So we have our local coordinate system. Didn't fit up there anymore. We have a local coordinate system. Let me try to reproduce this. Y prime, x prime, z prime. And we have our vector P, which is somehow this guy, P prime, constant here. And we want to know how quickly P is going to be changing if we are rotating this coordinate system with omega. Well, there's a very simple rule. Okay, we know how to express P prime in world coordinates. So P prime in world coordinates just has to be multiplied by the rotation matrix. Okay, so now we have this vector <coughs> p in world coordinates, which would be my big coordinate system here. Okay, z, y. Okay, and now we have basically a vector which rotates at a certain speed with omega, and we actually know that the cross product omega cross r times p prime gives us the velocity of that rotation. So that would actually be P dot, I hope. Okay. And now comes basically this, this analogy. So first we said P dot can be expressed like this, and now we said P dot can be expressed like that. And by analogy, there is only, well, what's, what's different, okay? P prime is the same, P dot is the same, actually R is the same. So we only have S of T and omega of T cross product. You know we can describe omega of this cross product, we can write it as S of omega as a matrix. And that now basically brings us into this nice thing that this S here, which we derived, is equivalent to the cross product. That's actually what is the interesting insight of that derivation. 
So we started with a time derivative of a rotation matrix, and through some silly substitutions, which initially looked weird, we get to the point that we can, by analogy, make the statement that this matrix S, which was, I think, R dot, I think it was R dot times R transpose originally, is equivalent to some cross product of the angular rotation omega. Good. This basically now allows us to go create R dots. Whenever we create an R dot, we have a way of, of rep uh, uh, replacing it with a cross product. Right. And before there was a statement, okay, S is Q symmetric, that kind of hinted towards that this could be coinciding with a cross product. Remember we wrote at some point that S transpose plus S equals zero, which only holds for skew symmetric matrices. And just we know that the uh, replacement of omega with a matrix is a skew symmetric matrix. So we have this all sorted out and we're happy forever after. And we basically, well, we can do all kinds of substitutions. Let me not go through those things, otherwise we'll run out of time totally. And move on. So we want now, and I'm not going to go through all the glory since this is coming too much. We want to now go back to this idea that we have a point in a local coordinate system, we have the rotation matrix and the offset. You could also write this as a homogeneous transformation matrix in case you remember. Um, we want to take the time derivative of this thing and see what happens. Okay? And I think here we can just look at what the book is doing. So time derivative again, we use the chain rule. It's P dot O dot this is easy than R times P dot and R dot times P. Okay, very straightforward. I don't have to write this again. But now comes the little trick that you can basically replace R dot here with S omega one zero of R. That's the transformation from the interworld coordinate system. That's what we're applying right now. Okay. And then we mean that means we can write this here as a cross product. And we're kind of happy. And then it's basically then he just says, okay, if P expressed in the local coordinates is actually constant in the local coordinate, then its time derivative is gonna be zero and this term drops out. So what you will see in Newton's Euler is that, now that we get rid of all this glory here, Newton Euler, we have multiple links, which I just now try to draw very simple. And we try to express things like the center of mass and other quantities with local distances like r to the center of mass. So we have these things which are fixed in a local coordinate system all the time. This is why we very frequently can drop these terms out. Actually, we will never see them again. Okay, so this was the generic rule, and all what he does now, he basically applies that to link velocities by creating a recursion. Same story as before. So let me see where, we have a, yeah, you must have a plot, which was higher up. So this is basically now the picture which we're working with. We have one link i here. We have its um, axis, it's joint, yes, joint i, and here's basically point i minus one, here's point i, here's the vector which goes there, here's the vector p i which goes there, and then there's locally kind of the distance between those two guys is, oops, the vector r, let me just write this, r i minus one i. Now, as you notice, the subscripts and things become a little annoying. Cool. So, if you have this picture in mind, then we basically just try to express link velocities by a recursion from one link to the next one. And that is essentially what this stuff is supposed to accomplish. Let me, maybe we need that picture. 
Let me just reproduce this picture real quickly. So we can refer to that for a second. Okay, so we have a coordinate system here, and we call this the world coordinate system, and we have yeah, a point I minus one. We go here for a point with kind of I, because here is P I minus one, this here is I, we kind of fantasize that this here is kind of our link somehow, or related to our link, which we care about. So this is link I, and you just hand it out there because it's easier to draw. And we have this offset vector here, which is going to be R I minus one, R to I, Okay, and as long as there's no superscript, it's all expressed in world coordinates, okay? I think I have all the notation we care. So then basically in this we no, where am I? I'm completely hopping around like crazy, sorry. Good, so now we say pi can be expressed as pi minus one times the rotation from, uh, from the i minus one's coordinate system times this guy. Ugh, okay, so I wanna, don't want to write these things a lot. I'll write it one time, so much fun. So pi equals pi minus one plus R, so the rotation matrix, which takes me from the I minus one coordinate system to the world coordinate system, and I can put the zero up there. And then, now comes the notation becomes real fun. I minus one I, so that's the distance between these two points, expressed in the I minus one coordinate system. Okay, fun. That's why he has to get the rotation matrix. So basically he expresses this distance in this local coordinate system. So that becomes now a constant in this local coordinate system. Then he rotates it in the world coordinate system and adds that offset. So it means this vector plus this vector gives this vector. In the end, it's totally straightforward. It's just notation-wise becomes a little bit unhappy. Good, and if you believe in that, um, all that we're gonna do now is differentiate. And we get exactly the same story as before. So we get all these little terms. We get a P dot, we get an R and, and a little R dot, and then we get the R you put in the substitution with a cross product where we got the matrix derivative, the, the rotation matrix derivative. And in the end, we end up here with this equation. So this is just the general expression. And that basically still assumes that R dot might be changing. Um, he keeps this in there for the one reason that if this happens to be a prismatic joint, we would need it. If it's a revolute joint, we will not need it. And he's going to drop it out later when he basically discusses the difference between prismatic degrees of freedom and revolute degrees of freedom. But he just leaves it in for, for a tiny moment. Whew. Okay. Let me just move on. It, I don't want to go through all of it. He does the same story for rotations, which is actually uh, much easier. Rotations just add up. So omega i, the, um, the angular velocities, I should say, sorry. Angular velocities are simply the previous angular velocity plus the next angular velocity. That's it. Not expressed in world coordinates, or here he expresses one in local coordinates. So this angular velocity in local coordinates would normally the uh, velocity of this particular degree of freedom revoluting, okay? And if uh, there's nothing rotating, it wouldn't exist potentially. Good. So there should be a summary of that. So it's, it's becoming too much fun. <laughs> Some of my fingers don't work today. 
Um, Chris Ma okay, here we get what do I want. That is a kind of what really matters in the end, all the things which you would like to. Oops, come on. A little bit more fine control would be good. We basically now differentiate between prismatic joints and revolute joints and get rules how to express the um, angular velocity and translatory velocity of a particular link. So very simple, prismatic joint says it doesn't rotate, so it's zero. And my transitory velocity is basically, this is kind of a Hartenberg notation, he uses the d dot, the change of d times the direction of it, the axis in which it goes, plugs it in, so you get that formula. And for, if you have a revolute joint, what you get is something which looks like this. This basically just means that you are, previous rotation angular velocity plus the angular velocity coming from your joint rotating get added up and the change of position of the link basically is derived as we just did it before. Fun! Yeehaw! We have to do the same thing for accelerations. So we have to do the same exercise again taking those equations and do a time derivative again comes a little bit later, but becomes the same mess, and I'm not going to go through it another time. Um, but I think you get the picture how this comes into being. Very important. If you would sit down and do this carefully and think through every of these darn indices, whether they're sub or super or whatsoever, and have that little plot in mind while you're doing it, it's not very hard to follow. When I'm talking about it, potentially it might be sometimes confusing. Just talking about these indices is confusing. So, but it's not very complicated. It's a very simple geometric argument how to make forward progress. Good. And now comes the next big picture, which I want. And let me get my mouse pointer. Let's do Newton Euler because it's so much fun. And my entire existence will be about explaining one plot. Okay, this is all the notation he's using. You could read to that, but you can actually try to understand it. And let me try to blow this up and reproduce it. Oh, God, this stupid thing he always craps out. I hate this. Just a moment. The problem is with a Windows computer. Okay, just a moment, please try to get the webcast going. Back. And I wanted to go to this thing, find my mouse pointer, blow this plot up, and just try to, whoopsie, explain it. Why am I so bad at everything? Here we go. So that is the key plot. And as you'll notice when I draw it one by one, it becomes actually very simple. So we take our favorite little um, think picture here. Whatever, something like this. So 
over here. I have to make this somehow 3D looking. And like this. Maybe better. So we have the rotation axis of joint I one and sphere of joint I. Cool. Then what else? We don't need so many things. The again I skip everything which comes from the motor, which will make this more uh, clearly that picture easier to understand. So we have one coordinate system here, which is QI minus one, and then he puts no O, sorry, it shouldn't be a Q, O for origin. And there's another one here, which is O I. So I don't put in the coordinate axis since they don't buy anything. And we have somewhere a center of mass, which we assume we know in local coordinates. Now, the distance of the center of mass from this point of view, from this coordinate system here, then becomes r i minus 1 to ci, the center of mass of this mix. And you can also write it equivalently like from here, it would be r i to ci. And we have at the center of mass our good old friend gravity acting, which creates Si times G. And G rest zero. I call it either I call it G. Although it's not a G in some system, but most likely he means that. Okay. Um and we have the entire link on the thing before. Right. Terrible. It's just fine. From here to there is R I minus one I as in the previous picture which we just had. Good. So this is kind of setting up the geometry of this. Now what do you do with four momentum balance? What what happens from a pure physics point of view is you put in all forces of momentum you know in a very general way. Okay, we already started. I was um, simply say that here has to be a momentum which we call my new i plus one. I'll come back to the. Let me put the other momentum on the other side. I can end up talking about this. This here is called new i. The rule is always right hand rule. You stick your finger into the arrow. And that's what's called a positive momentum. So where do they come from? Well, we just took this big, cut it out of a robot. Okay, here's a big robot. Let's take me for instance, big robot. Just consider my arm and cut it out, discarding it. But do not change about this. You cut my, my entire You have to put in four forces and force that my, that my upper arm stays there. Same on yeah. the other side. Uh, we just make it a cutting feature without changing the position or anything of this of this link. So that basically momentum. And there's the next cutting afterwards. And the interesting thing is if I put the other one in, the momenta and the forces have to balance each other. That's what good old Newton told us at some point. And we always have to have force. Negative power. The other side plus mu one as a moment, and if you put together, they would just balance, and everything would be happy. This is why we have the mu i the negative minus one there. On the other side, they have to have the negative sign. Otherwise, they wouldn't put everything together. If you add up all the. Alright, the same thing with this. That's the same argument. Your force minus plus one, so that you can inherit from the link on the right, and our force here locally is going to be 
<laughs> and then we just this little thing is doing what? It's rotating this omega. Up. This is this guy, and it's translating at the center of the map with p dot c i. I think we have all in there. But how is it? But that the right hand side is negative, the force is negative in the moment. It's very simple. Here, two links make this a strange springboard swimming pool. Swimming pool, water. You jump this time. Okay, normally, up here, jump. It's a beautiful thing. Now, if I went things up here. Then original is from this be pushed. And according to there has to be forces up there right. to counterbalance that. Let's make the force here. And then there's a minus the two counterbalance. We basically just turn what comes from the next link here and we put a negative sign on it because I to be Probably from the negative. Now we could change that. Don't like it. Cool. Now all we got to do is we write force balances and torque balances. Since according to Mr. Newton, all of those and Mr. Euler, they have to basically sum up in that formula. So here's what we do with force balances. That's now very straightforward. You take all four half and just a and so force you have only three forces. Da 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 da. I is minus F one plus M I times G. And Mr. Newton, this has to be equivalent to the mass acceleration of it's off. If it's that. That's a And this, and we have to do the same thing for momenta. Um, what is interesting? What is interesting? Well. You can see all the recruit. Then I can an FI by taking MI PCI double dot plus FI one minus MI G. Why is this interesting? Well, this tells me how to express the force FI based on quantities which are local to the link. This is the mass, it's acceleration, and the gravity component, which is great. Plus the force high up. And here's the thing of love. If you have a robot, you go to the veil. This was the force and I have yes. So there is there is no connecting link anymore. It means I thought at all the where there is FI plus one, I can compute the previous FI and then I can make my way down iteratively. That's kind of the idea. Yes. The Quick check how much time we're doing okay. Um Doing the same thing for momentum. momentum. Again, he puts always motor stuff inside, uh, and we try to avoid that if possible. Does he have motor? Yeah, and the inertia components. He has the motor components. Everything which has a little M thing, we just skip. We don't need that. So the momentum 
is much more complicated, but not much. I mean, ignore it if we don't care about it. Um, right now, I don't want to care about it because it creates too many terms, and it just replicates other terms, which are just more math and novel insights. Um, if you want to model a robot properly, you would have to put them in. But you can also, often you can estimate all the mass parameters as a big, as, as everything together without explicit modeling the mass, uh, the, the motors. So that's what most people do. Try to do the So momentum balance, same idea. So we have mu i is 1, then minus minus 1. That's 1. These are the two momenta. So we have them here. But then we get additional ones from the forces, remember? You do a momentum balance. When you do a momentum balance, you need a reference point. And we use the center of mass as a reference point. That means actually the force F with a distance like this, this is the same idea of the springboard again. You're standing here on the springboard. It means at this point here, where this thing is attached to the concrete, there is a moment that's going to be F cross your weight. You are forced to the springboard. Okay? And that's what we're going to do right now. So we basically simply say F I <coughs> cross the offset means the distance to the mass which is R I ones. And I hope I have this turn now correctly. That creates a momentum. And then we have to do this from here that this F minus one force creates also a momentum relative to here. And it should be the so minus plus one cross R I and this has to be well, the change of which is the same equation derived as PDT of the change of momentum with I times omega. That's the inertia. And we forget all the other terms. And then he basically quickly shows that that basically results. This type of derivative results in this formula. I'm not going to go through this. It's just an exercise of Zero it is matrix, putting a cross product operator instead of blah, 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 and ending up exactly with this. So we get basically this formula on the right. I want the entire theorem. The entire thing, doesn't you write it more nicely somewhere? Yeah, yeah, here's what I want. So the, this is all motor line is all from the motor. We can ignore that for the moment for our little derivation. So we have momentum, momentum, and momentum from the force on the left side, momentum force on the right side, equals basically the um, change of momentum which we get. That's essentially the Euler formula. Oof, so much fun. Now, uh, what's important about this stuff? Let's see, if we look at a recursion, we should be able to figure out the problem. We wanted to express mu i as a function of everything else. You know, fi we know from our previous force calculation. That we've already done. This is a kinematic thing. We know that mu i plus one we assume is known from the previous link, and at the very last one it's going to be zero. <coughs> F one we know already from the previous link, and all these inertia is a local, so we are fine. Same idea of creating a recursion. I know it's a lot of equations and not so easy to pick up. 
but I think you get the picture at least. Not, not that I expect you to derive that fluently or anything like this. Cool. And now we have that. All we just realized that there's occasionally some acceleration things, and I mentioned that to you before. So link accelerations. We had before, these were the link velocities, and now he does the entire mess for adding another point on this equation, another dot. I'm not going to go. This is just massive. I don't want to do this. Um, this is the database. It's just taking derivatives, doing again, getting lots of cross product, figuring out what's good or bad about them. And here's what I like. In sum, you get basically equations for our prismatic and revolution. That is the axle, the angular acceleration and the translatory acceleration look like these things. Okay? Yeah, these are the if the um there's in the theta double dot, that's the acceleration of this particular degree of freedom. I did not mention one thing properly. If I just go back for a second and you forgive me. What our, let's see. What the algorithm, the Newton algorithm does is telling you how to express a force on the left with respect to all the knowledge we have on the right. The same with the momentum. If you want to know what's the torque a degree of freedom has to generate, like if I compute here at some point a mu r, so how much does your motor have to support? How strongly does it have to push? Well, that's very simple. You just take mu i, it's a vector, and you basically project it with an inner product on your rotation axis or your axis of movement, which is di. That's the component the motor has to hold out against. All the other components of mu i would be supported by the mechanical structure. This is how we actually get to the point that we get our tau eyes. This is what he has basically written here, and I did not mention that properly. So mu i inner product with the i product, this is motor stuff, forget about this, gives you for revolute joint the torque, and if it's a prismatic joint, it's just f i inner product with the i. I should not have forgotten that. Since that's intended to be quantity, which we in the end want when we do um, dynamics computation. So you are solidly happy, I see that. I'm solidly tired. And I think we try to go to the summary of all of this. That's kind of useful. This is all yuck. I thought there was a nice figure. And there's still a nice figure. So let me make this a little bit smaller. And this figure is useful to just summarize what's going on. All the equations are somewhere written somewhere, and he has basically equation numbers at various points. What do you have to do to compute Newton Euler? So essentially, very straightforward. Get rid of this picture. We want to get to forces and torques at every degree of freedom. But what we need is velocities and accelerations at every link. So what we're going to do is first we compute velocities and accelerations as a first step. And how we do that, again, look at the robot. We actually saw that we can find recursive equations which compute velocities and accelerations. And if you start at the base, the base has zero velocity and zero acceleration. So you can actually propagate from this knowledge velocities upward in the chain. And that's basically what he tries to tell us, hopefully, here. We basically, knowing our joint positions, velocities, and accelerations, we can automatically compute the joint angular velocities and translatory velocities and accelerations as well for both quantities at every degree high up the chain. So there's a recursion which goes through this like this. This gives us velocities and acceleration. And after we have this, 
we can actually now propagate back forces and momenta. We know there is no force of momentum at the very last joint. And basically go back the chain down there. This way we get force and momentum. And here we got essentially all the, uh, what did you call them? P, P dot, P double dot, and omega and omega dot. And that's essentially what Newton Euler does. You do a first pass, you get all the kinematic stuff computed, then you do a backward pass, you get all the forces, and you project at every degree of freedom in the end, the force of the momentum vector in the axis T1, and you get the equations of motion which we want. Oof, so beautiful. Here is all of it in one happy summary, I believe. These are the equations you have to do. In the end, it's not so terrible if you look at this. You just need to know all the quantities, skip all the motor components, get in touch with the superscripts and subscripts, and you're happy forever after. But now we're combining literally everything. We're combining our knowledge of kinematics, coordinate transformations, and now a little bit of forces and torques to get the entire dynamics of the system model. And that becomes just incredibly efficient. That's the beauty of it. Time-wise, good. Um, this is nothing new. So out of this equation in the end, we get our good old friend, which I mentioned the last time. B of Q times Q double dot plus C of Q Q dot times Q dot to be precise, plus D of Q equal to tau. So for every degree of freedom, basically, what, what is the input to any dynamics algorithm of this kind, which is essentially what's called an inverse dynamics algorithm, since you basically read, you have the taus, the forces or torques on the right side, and all the other stuff on the inside. So if you know Q, Q dot, and Q double dot, for every degree of freedom you have, you automatically create the forces or torques tau at every degree of freedom you have. You can compute them. Which also means, if you think about it, let's assume what's the state of a two degree uh, of a second order system. The second order system is described by position and velocity. And assume you know that you want from this state, accelerate in a particular way to make this theta, uh, Q double dot desired, then that would tell you what are the torques which you have to put into the system in order to achieve that acceleration. Now we're getting back to control. And that's what we're going to do primarily the next time. So knowing these functions here, we can compute torques which accomplish a particular state or which take us out of a given state with a particular acceleration. And this is all that we're going to do in robotics in the end. We basically plan some position velocities and accelerations and try to figure out what torques are the right ones to push us in this direction as accurately as possible. Now, as a remark, there's kind of a big difference between deriving this year and then writing an equation like that. <coughs> it took people a while to figure out that the equations can be written like that. It was not so straightforward to simplify. But after you realize that, what you now get if you have someone who can write this math, it's just a function, okay? We just create a inverse dynamics function. Oops, cannot write anymore. Let's call it inverse dynamics. And just in some pseudo coding, this is a vector q, vector q dot, and vector q double dot outputs tau. And these are all vector quantities. That's the C function or Java or whatever model function you would like to have. This is the stuff which is inside of that. So there has to be additional knowledge about the kinematics of the robot and, and masses and all these kind of things and inertia. But this is how this thing in the end works. What is interesting about this now is if you actually wanted to get individual quantities of this equation, you can actually use that little function to help you. So for instance, 
if you just wanted to know the gravity component, how much gravity force and torque do you need to support the robot when it's standing still? Well, very simple to say. The TF to zero and this to zero, one year level function, and you know that if you have Q double dot zero, this will be canceled. If you have Q dot zero, this will be canceled. So then you get only the gravity forces of torques. It's a nice little function to use. And you can play other games if you just want to know what's the contribution from the Coriolis forces and, and, and contributor forces. So if you take Q double dots to zero, you get rid of that. If you compute G of Q, as I just told you, and then you compute basically, oh, sorry, wrong, wrong sequence. You compute G of Q first, you know how to do this. This was here. Um, so this here basically was G of Q. <coughs> Then you said basically you just compute C plus G, and this basically you do tau equals inverse dynamics of Q and Q dot, and this here is a zero. And then you can subtract the G from this and you get the C term. So we can basically mess around with those, with this function and in an indirect way get a hold of those individual components if we need them. And we will need them later on a little bit. Okay, that was it. Kind of painful, I know. But I just, so this is what's behind most of dynamics computation in, in modern robots. We have very, this is an algorithm written in a standard way. There is what is called spatial vector arithmetic. It's another way of writing this where the entire algorithm becomes like four lines of highly symbolic code, but very easy to compute. There is software programs which could kind of compute these things for you by basically you should provide all the coordinate transformation, link lengths, and symbols for mass and inertia, and then they spit out pages of C code how to do that. There's the most um, famous program is, I think, SD Fast used by the graphics community a lot. It can compute a lot of things, kinematics, dynamics, all kinds of additional functions. It's expensive if you want to use it, and there's proprietary code which it generates, so you cannot give it away afterwards. And there's other machines which can do the same thing. So we have our own little version which does that, which then basically is full under our control. Um, so you will never be, hopefully never be deriving that yourself, but having the basic knowledge of what physics is behind it and how this is done, if it all relates to this equation, it's actually very useful. I think we're done for today. Thank you.